development of this telepresence system, particularly the Argo camera apparatus, named after the mythical ship that carried Jason and the Argonauts in their search for the Golden Fleece. To test Argo, they have their own Golden Fleece, Titanic, but the funds still aren't enough to mount an expedition. So then I went deeper into the Navy. <laughs> and being a naval officer, and having been involved in a lot of programs, I went to the other side of the Navy, the more classified side of the Navy, and I talked to them. I wasn't in the room, but I doubt the Navy called the Bob Ballard up and, and uh, asked him to go find the Titanic. I, it, was his, it was his dream, it was his goal, and uh, uh, he convinced them, as we were doing other work for the Navy, um, that we should be able to take some of our time and go, go attempt this, uh, this difficult task. The Cold War is still raging, and Argo can help the Navy with two separate problems. Two sunken submarines, one called the USS Thresher, sunk due east of Woods Hole in 1963. The other is the USS Scorpion, which sank just five years later, 400 miles southwest of the Azores off the coast of Portugal. The Navy wants Dr. Robert Ballard to use the new technology to monitor the nuclear stability or instability of those sunken subs and their nuclear reactors. So the Navy said, look, we want you to go find the reactors. We want you to completely map them. We want to find every square inch of these submarines. And that became our classified mission, secret mission. With additional Navy funding, Woods Hole engineers and technicians start bringing Argo to life in 1982. This 4,000 pound cage the size of an automobile filled with three specialized dark vision cameras and sonar will be a leap ahead in deep sea imaging. In some cases, depending on the type of vehicle, you may be power limited into the amount of light that you can bring. So usually we use very low light or very high sensitive camera systems for, for imaging in the deep sea. In 1984, Argo sees its first action in a secret mission to the USS Thresher. The Thresher was just, just destroyed. It was just like passed it through a shredding machine. We knew where it was because they'd visited, but they had never mapped it. They just went down and looked around. But they'd never done a systematic search. They never found the reactor. Having found all of the remains of the sub, Ballard wants to push farther out into the Atlantic to find Titanic. But there is another hurdle. Woods Hole is a science institution, and its management isn't convinced that finding the Titanic or any shipwreck is the best use of its resources. First of all, they're hazardous. They, all tend, they tend to be covered and festooned with nets and cables and things that, that are entanglement hazards. And then secondarily, from a research standpoint, they're not, they're not the best subject matter. It was not that they were passive. They did not want me to do it. And so that was tough. Ballard persuades the institution that finding Titanic will be a high-profile way to test their new technology. In addition to the funds from the Navy, Ballard seeks a partnership with a European counterpart to Woods Hole. The French Institute for Research and Exploration of the Seas, or EFREMER, joins the effort. They come up with a two-pronged attack. The first leg of the voyage gets underway on June 24, 1985. Ephraimer scientist Jean-Louis Michel begins the search for the Titanic. He will employ his new sonar acoustique remorque, or towed acoustic sonar. The sonar is a side scan sonar. That means the sonar is flying not far from the bottom, but about 400, 500 feet from the bottom. And the sonar could dive to 20,000 feet and he was brand new for that. The plan was the French sonar system called SAR would find the wreck uh, and then we would go photograph it. Ballard and the Woods Hole scientists joined their French colleagues on board the French research vessel La Serra on July 22, 1985. The party steams to the search site and deploys the SAR directly over Jack Grimm's unchecked target. As it is on its way down, SAR's onboard metal detector goes crazy. The current is strong though, and the ship gets pushed away from this small section of the ocean. Without sonar confirmation, they assume the metal detector needs adjustment. 
Jean-Louis Michel decides to check out this area at the end of the cruise. He now continually moved away from the Titanic. It had a chance now. That's fate. He never had enough time to go back and get that final missing sliver. And I'll never forget coming back. I felt like Grimm. I felt like Ryan. I tasted defeat. It's not very nice taste. The Titanic searchers disembark from La Serra on August 8, 1985. On August 12th, Ballard and Michelle join the American portion of the quest, the part that was supposed to be a photo opportunity with a found Titanic. The 245-foot Woods Hole ship Noor leaves dock from Ponta Delgado in the Azores. But first, Ballard has a top secret commitment to the Navy to keep, the survey of the other sunken nuclear sub, the USS Scorpion, 400 miles southwest of the Azores. The crew has been given clearances by the U.S. Navy, but the French scientists and the media aboard have not. Bellard has to be less than straightforward about his mission. What I told them was that I had to do some tests for the Navy, that this was a Navy system and that they had to not come in our control room. And I thought they would catch me because the, the Scorpions south of the Azores and Titanic's west, well, I thought they'd look up and see where the sun was and say, you know, Bob, aren't we headed south? But they didn't. With each of these sub hunts, Ballard is learning more about how he might find Titanic. The thresher has been completely blown apart while the scorpion was basically intact. Yet they have similar debris fields, ones that show up right away on Argo's cameras. We pass this line, it's like just a line that there's nothing and then there's everything. I mean, you, you come into a debris tr field. It's a lesson Ballard will remember. In accordance with his agreement with the Navy, he's now free to do what he wishes with the rest of his time on this voyage. On August 24th, the Noor, packed with expectant French and American scientists and researchers, arrives near the area where the French search had left off. Argo's video cameras will prove or disprove Ballard's idea that video is a better search tool than sonar. Bob just zigzagged up the eastern end of the survey area, gambling that if he did the zigzags tight enough, he would intersect the debris. Quickly, though, the crew's morale plummets as days click by without a trace of the elusive wreck. It was very, very tedious in a lot of ways. It was, you know, frustrating. You, you really wanted to see something. You know, day after day, it was becoming very monotonous, very routine, not finding anything, just looking at mud and an occasional fish would swim by. And people definitely were becoming disheartened. As I recall, people were sort of checking off the hours until we could head home. August slips by. The crew is just four days away from their return date. It seems Titanic has evaded yet another determined and skilled search party. Then, just before 1 a.m. on September 1st, 1985, everything changes. It was just another watch. We'd all been used to staring at, at black and white images of the deep sea floor, of a featureless deep sea floor for, you know, watch after watch after watch. And in this watch, we started to pick up little objects here and there. They weren't rocks, they weren't fish, they weren't sand waves, they were very angular bits of something. And as it turns out, as history will tell you, that what the first images were coming back up were of the boiler with the very recognizable pattern of, of rivets in the face of the boiler. God, it's a boiler! It's like a boiler! Yes, yes. There's no mistaking it. The object is an early 20th century coal-fired steamship boiler. It is past midnight. The crew aboard the Noor awakes.
of course, my first reaction was to roll over and go back to bed because the big joke on the trip had been, hey, wake up, we found the Titanic, you know. Dr. Ballard 